Okay, well, thank you all for being here. We will begin. Uh, I am Dr. Karen Myers, along with Dr. Jen Roberts and Dr. Mark Poussin, the committee, and uh, Jackie Kerner, the defendee. How about that? Um, so this is Jackie's defense, and, and we do consider in higher education administration um, defenses as, as a celebration. And so Jackie's come a long way with lots of work on this project, and we're very happy to be here today to hear your results and to um, celebrate with you. But we all also have questions. All right. So let me tell you a little about the process. Uh, we will. Jackie has been asked to present for around 20 minutes or so uh, about her the results of her dissertation, and we will. Um, possibly interject or, or uh, interrupt as the time goes on, or we might let her get through it, I don't know. But but it is just the committee, and then what we'll do is ask questions and comment, and then when we're finished, I will open it up to the audience, and you may ask questions or comment as well. And then we ask, well, let's see. We'll decide if the three of us leave or if all of you leave, because the process is that the committee um, uh, discusses and votes, and then uh, bring Jackie back and tell her the results. And that's it. So we'll let you begin. Okay. Does anybody know if there's more than one light switch? Because I just see the one light switch, and the, I think this room is smarter than me. So that's let's good. see. That's not a light switch. I think it is. Let's see. Do we feel like that's too dark and cozy? I'm good. You are. Whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Okay, we're okay. All right. All right. Nobody snoozing. and no afternoon snoozing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So my title of my dissertation is an exploration of the lived experiences of college students with disabilities. And why study students with disabilities? So in a lot of my reading, I found that there were students with disabilities, but a lot of the research did not focus on the students and their experience. A lot of it was about the students, how they are doing in the environment, but it's not coming from the students. So we have 2,266,000 students with disabilities per the statistical abstract in 2012 from the census out of 20,928 total college students. And a lot of those students typically attend the community college. Now, that's because community colleges are close to family, the community that they're already in, the support network, services they're already familiar with, and then also a smaller campus size. They're not going to bigger research institutions or even institutions like us. We're large, we're not that large, but to a student who's transitioning into that college with disabilities. College transitions are already difficult for individuals without disabilities, but that adds another level. Now, attending any higher education institution is um, for the students with disabilities is at a rate less than half of their peers without disabilities. Now, this includes vocational colleges, community colleges, and the four-year higher education institutions. Now, I focused on only four-year higher education institutions because we have, of those students who enroll at four-year higher education institutions, only 34% graduate. So only 34% of those students persist through to graduation. Now, why the study design? College students with disabilities often do not disclose their disabilities to their higher education institutions. This is largely due to the stigma associated with the disability. In their primary and secondary education environment, they're supported by IDEA, and they have an educational team that supports their learning needs, their learning plan, and individualized education plan, potentially. Whereas in at the college level, students with disabilities have to advocate for themselves. So they can choose whether or not to disclose their disability. And some students, they see it's turning over in a week, when to start completely new and not have that associated stigma. Research available has lacked the voices of students with disability. Now, Gibson says this largely in a lot of her research, and Dr. Myers says this. Um, 
it's something that's very important. How can you know the experiences of people without asking them? How can you even expect to grasp what they're dealing with as a person without addressing them? And I chose to not, dis not narrow the study per disability. There are studies out there that focus on autism spectrum disorders or students uh, who are deaf, students with visual disabilities. But I chose not to limit because I did not want to exclude anyone's experience since there are so many disabilities out there. From this study alone, I had so many disabilities that I did not even imagine I was going to get. I mean, they had a, there were a few that I, that I thought, oh yeah, I'll get definitely, you know, at least one person with an autism spectrum disorder, and then maybe someone with uh, a learning disability. But I had no idea how many different disabilities I was going to receive. Now, the study purpose. The purpose of this qualitative study was to investigate the experience of the student with disabilities <clears throat> during attendance at four-year degree guaranteeing higher education institutions. Now again, going back to that 34% graduation rate, this is exactly why I wanted to examine it, and also the stigma of disclosing the disability. So those are the two major things that I wanted to say, and look at the four-year degree, the students who are going to get the four-year degree. The outcomes of attending and graduating with a four-year degree for students with disabilities are amazing. It's, it's incredible because the learning potential for students with disabilities who graduate from higher education institutions is equal, is, has been shown to be equal, of that of students who graduate with a four-year four degree without disabilities. So it's, it's very important. Now, breathe, <laughs> I put that in parentheses because it's kind of funny, not quite brief. But while society has greatly progressed from lifetime institutionalization of individuals with disabilities, the focus now needs to include supporting rights and integrating individuals with disabilities into the community so they may fulfill their ideal roles within society. The benefits of including students with disabilities in the higher education environment reach beyond the individuals themselves. Students with disabilities can achieve success in higher education. Society on the whole, however, needs to support their needs as learners. Again, going back to those outcomes that I was talking about, there is a large percentage of students, of people with disabilities, who are on government support because they have not been supported potentially to go through higher education. They have been supporting their education. And it's just a cyclical problem. It's going to keep going if we don't interrupt this cycle, we don't support the needs of those students as learners and examine their value as they are in society. Their self-confidence, their employment prospects, their earnings, and then, like I said, less reliance on the social programs. Now, key theories that really inform this study, the medical model of disability defines disability based upon the biological factors of the disability, so the manifestation of the disability, and frames the individual in that regard, and looks at them potentially as, um, as an abnormal, you know, instead of in the normal society. The social model then focuses on how society has developed around people with disabilities or people without disabilities or the quote unquote able-bodied. So society does not look at this as a normal diversity in society. It's been focused on the able-bodied. So for example, uh, people with disabilities, uh, something that's very personal to me is providing materials during presentations. If people need to be accommodated, then they should be able to receive that accommodation. Now, normal society, we've all seen PowerPoints that may have very, very small font or uh, maybe have you know, red font or different colors. That's not accessible for everyone, and everyone should be able to receive that information and learn from that information. So again, this is why my PowerPoint is black and white, so that everyone can really enjoy the information that's being presented. Now, Gibson's disability identity development adult excuse me, development model um, is 
really important because it looks at the development of the person, their student development theory, and as people go through college or into adulthood, they're provoked through different stages or different um, settings to where they grow into this next level. Now with disability, there's passive awareness where individuals start, where their medical needs are addressed, they don't associate with people with disabilities, they don't have positive role models of people with disabilities. And then there's realization where they develop an awareness, they're concerned with their appearances, and may deal with anger and self-hate. And then the third, acceptance, acceptance of themselves, associate with other people with disabilities, and view themselves as relevant in society. Now, individuals can certainly oscillate back and forth between the last two stages, between two and three. So that's, it's not once you've reached acceptance, you're there. They can certainly go back and forth. Now, my research questions that I aim to answer. Number one, what motivates students with disabilities to attend higher education? How do self-advocacy skills, or the lack thereof, impact the higher education experience of students with disabilities? How do students with disabilities perceive the accommodations they receive at higher education institutions? I found some very interesting things. A lot of the students, they had said that they always considered college an inevitability. I had one student who was uh, the first in our family to go to college, but said, oh, I've always, always thought that was gonna be on the horizon for sure. And then, how do self-advocacy, advocacy, excuse me, advocacy, what are those words? Advocacy and uh, accommodations occasionally hit me. Um, how do self-advocacy skills, or the lack thereof, impact the students? It was really interesting because a lot of the individuals, they oscillated back and forth and said, oh, I'm a great self-advocate, I do great at that. But then some of the things that they were talking about, kind of said, oh, are you really comfortable there? Kind of pointing to maybe they weren't as comfortable at self-advocacy as they really had indicated. And then the accommodations, students immediately said, oh yeah, I'm excited about the accommodations. I think they're great. They're so supportive. But then receiving the accommodations, that was different. They were able to get the accommodations, but using them is a different story. All right, the brief study design. Higher education colleagues forwarded the study information to the student body. I reached out to several colleagues and several different institutions who had a connection with disability services on their campus. The interested parties emailed for more information and the interviews were scheduled. The semi-structured interviews were planned to be about an hour. I was so excited when students had so much to say and went over that hour. That was wonderful. More often than not, students went over the hour. I only had one that was about a half an hour, but then all the other ones were really close to an hour, and I had about three that were over an hour. It was wonderful. They were all audio recorded, and then I decided to personally transcribe them because I wanted that intimacy with the data, and then I also coded them. And this is kind of a fun fact. I had 362 quotations I took out of those nine interviews. 362 things that I felt were really strong and relevant to, to add. And I'm so sad that I could not include all 362 quotes for you all today in this presentation. <laughs> but you guys have dinner to get to, I'm sure. <laughs> so the data collection. 15 students responded, and this was right around finals time, so I did not expect a big response. And I, am so, I was so delighted to get the 15 students that I did. Nine actually scheduled interviews. The all, all the other ones expressed, gosh, it's just a hard time for me, these finals and papers, because this was April. So I understood. 14 disabilities were disclosed during the interviews. So those nine students disclosed 14 disabilities. They were all 10 different academic majors. All the face-to-face -face interviews uh, happened. I did do one over Skype, and that worked out uh, just fine. It actually worked out just fine. Um, I was able to uh, connect with the student. She didn't have any technology issues. Uh, she said she felt comfortable participating over, over Skype, so we did that. And I took notes on the dialogue, the participant mood changes, 
and the nonverbal communication during the interviews. Now the data analysis, I decided to start doing the data analysis after the first interview. Uh, Miriam discusses the importance of starting data analysis because then that can help guide your later view of the research project and maybe see where you need to tailor your, your questions or maybe where you need to dive deeper into the information to appropriately get all the information. I listened to the audio recordings multiple times. Even after I transcribed, I decided to listen to the audio a couple times over just to really get the feeling, get the essence of the students. I read the transcripts of the interviews and I aligned the interview transcripts with the researcher notes that I took during the interviews. And I took excerpts from the interviews, those was 362, and I coded the data. I took, uh, I used a software um, piece and I coded them with different colors. And it was really, really helpful to do it that way because I got a data, data visualization of the, um, of the different themes that came out of that. And that was helpful in guiding my discussion. So resulting themes. First was identity, going back to Gibson's identity development model. A lot of the pieces that the individuals talked about really aligned well with Gibson's model. Then under that, I decided self-advocacy was connected with identity, self-worth, and then goals and motivation. And then accommodations, I put accommodations, that was my biggest thing that the students talked about. They talked about accommodations I had over 108 quotes about the accommodation process and about academic life. Support from others was very important and students, when they responded about support from others, a lot of it was from family. And a lot of the students seemed surprised when people on campus or when their friends uh, that they weren't close with would support them and their needs. Social interaction was also another theme. Assumptions and stigma and then finally barriers. Now, under identity, each of the different themes, I added quotes that I felt strongly about. Now, I, again, I would have loved to have included all the quotes, but I could not. Uh, the first quote, I'm like, no, it's totally cool. I'd like to talk to you about it and tell you about it. It's part of who I am. And then the next quote, still about talking to people about it. They'll ask a bunch of questions, and I don't mind talking about it. And then another person said, I'm normal. I just learned a little differently, and it might take me a little longer to get somewhere. And then finally, this is who I am. I identify as being dyslexic. It's not a diagnosis, it's my identity now. I, like I'm this machine of wanting information. I want to know more about it. Sometimes the participants spoke about their disabilities positively, and at other times the participants seemed sad when speaking about their disabilities. Self-depreciating jokes, or attuning themselves to popular culture. Um, I felt like Rain Man. I had one person say that having people think of Rain Man always when they thought of autism spectrum disorders really affected him because he said, it's not like I'm not fully functioning, but then they assume that all of a sudden when I tell them and disclose this, I'm going to be like Rain Man, even though they've known me for six months. I'm all of a sudden going to be like Rain Man, and that was really frustrating to him. And then suggestion of acceptance level according to Gibson's disability identity development model. And some of them seemed like they were oscillating back and forth or had memories of oscillating back and forth between stages one and two. Continuing on with identity, I mean learning to use this gift to my advantage, it's kind of neat trying to figure me out. I really like it. It, it was all about like my battle with dyslexia almost, and it's, I say my battle, but it's almost like a war because it's an everyday struggle. At first I felt uncomfortable. These are my limitations. Sometimes I'm going to need help. I never considered it a disability. I honestly didn't know it was a disability until this year. This is interesting because some people, they say they're still learning about themselves, even into adulthood, which is wonderful. Some individuals, they just recently learned about their disabilities. And gosh, I had one student who was diagnosed in high school, 
and uh, several that were diagnosed in college. So it's, it's something that they're still learning and they're still starting to appreciate themselves. And some, in, some of the individuals realized their limits. Uh, one person, Taylor, said that um, understanding limits, and I think Lane said some of the th same things, limits and understanding limits and appreciating the limits and not seeing that as negative was very difficult at first, but then just saying, that's who I am, it's okay. And then the frustrations of fighting with disabilities, um, here Sydney talks about the war because it's an everyday struggle. Sometimes she would wake up, it'd be one way, another day she'd wake up and it'd be a rough day. So it's, it's an everyday struggle. Now self-advocacy. The first quote, I just took the initiative and emailed the Disability Center to ask them. I consider myself a self-advocate. I'm a pretty good advocate for myself, but all of this shouldn't be falling to me. And finally, I saw academic coaching. Let's pause there for a second. I saw academic coaching. This student said, I need help, and it wasn't a disability that she was diagnosed with, but she said, mm, I'm seeing some signs here, and I think I need some help to be successful here. And so that's where she was advocating for herself and recognizing her needs as a learner on her own. And then finally, the last quote on this page, Every first class, I have to be the person who goes up to the teacher and be like, hi, I have a disability, how do you want to do this? And that was, that was Sydney. She, she seemed like this was, it was a joke, but she said sometimes the teachers will say, oh, get me next class, or come back to me, or just email me later about it. And that really diminished her self-advocacy. She's like, here I am trying to talk to you about this and trying to get the help I need, but you're just saying, oh, talk about it later, and blowing me off when it could be something that could come up very soon in the class where she needs the assistance. Um, the first quote, this was Dakota, talked about uh, the confidence. I mean, he was like, yeah, I'm so bad because I've been doing this all my life, no big deal. And he just was immediately out there, and he's like, yeah, I just always ask for what I need, and just emails people and gets it, gets it done, um, whereas, uh, Dakota's disability is not in, an invisible disability, whereas a lot of the other disabilities are. And it should not always be falling to the student. That was another very interesting thing that Shane had said. I thought, yeah, it shouldn't be because these students, they go to the Office of Disability Services, advocate for themselves, and then they're having to go back and say, okay, I need, I need help still. And, get that going with the faculty members, and it's still it's a difficulty. And even in the classroom setting, Shane was having to advocate for herself and say, okay, this isn't working for me, but didn't have the support of the faculty members. Now, self-worth. These were quotes that really stood out to me because I feel every individual should have the right to education, and every individual, I follow Howard Gardner's, ideals about multiple intelligences. Everyone is valued and intelligent in their own abilities. And the first one, I was just a good kid. I failed. And I was held back. I was belittled by people. I truly believed it. And this progressed throughout my entire, my whole entire career. I had no idea what was wrong with me. I'm, just, I'm like just a village idiot. I'm still like trying to be on that level of yes, I can be normal. It, it's still that like that acceptance thing of like yes, you are different. Yes, you learn differently. You can um, you can't just take all of this on at once. You can't be super. And that one really stuck with me because it's again this is this last one here, Sydney. It's that struggle, that everyday war that Sydney was dealing with, and. What really struck me about the other quotes was the self-hate that was evident in the, the stigma and the hate that was absorbed by the person. And this person was not elevated to, you know, be what you can be, be you know, you follow your dreams, etc. No, this person was essentially told, no, nope, you're not smart enough. No, nope, you're dumb. And that's, that's just not what educators should be doing, right? So, um, so basically, I didn't want to be as vulnerable as that anymore. This was by Alex. 
she had um, gone through an accident and her disabilities have somewhat healed. Uh, but she finds this to be, she finds herself to be stronger now. And she's worried about being in that vulnerable situation if another accident were to happen, being in that vulnerable situation again. I know it's hard to believe, but actually I was smarter than this. As um, I'm going to skip through because I'm going over on time. But that again was Alex. And before the accident, she had a friend. Well, before the accident, I was smart. Before the accident, I didn't have these problems. Before the accident, I could learn this no problem. And that really, that really concerned me because she was not seeing herself as capable and able and strong now. And finally, I am who I am, but can't help but feeling that I'm not enough. The final quote. And that's just, we should be empowering these students. And the self-worth of students with disabilities is something educators need to pay greater attention to. Considering we take such terrific interest in developing programming rooted in student development theory in order to provoke the identity development of students that are institutions. So we need to pay greater attention as educators to the self-worth and the identity development of students with disabilities. Now goals and motivation, uh, I'm going to run through this rather quickly. Uh, it was natural for them to consider education, never considered not going. Always knew I was going to go to college, uh, something many people in my family achieved. So college was a tradition for a lot of people. And the motivation part, we have a lot of people, oh my gosh, there were every person said that they can't wait to get their careers, they're so excited about their careers, they want to give back to the community. We even had some people who have plans to go with Teach for America, AmeriCorps, and really give back for it and have that year of service after their undergraduate program and then go into perhaps a graduate program. So it was really wonderful um, to see that they had those goals. And even there was some worry. Some individuals had worry about what's going to happen when I go into my, my career. Are they going to accommodate me? Are they going to be comfortable with me? What's a fireable offense? Sydney was really worried because she's going into engineering. So what if I flip a number? It, am I going to get fired? Because I want to send robots to space. And that's some serious dollars, she was saying. So she's just really concerned. Can she do that? Now, accommodations. Here's the, the big piece here. Uh, the accommodations. It seems very um, like you're out in the open for this paper to be given to the school. And that stays on file. Here, Alex is talking about the process of receiving accommodations when the process of this, at this particular institution, the process started with going to the office and saying, I need accommodations, you provide documentation. Alex had to provide documentation saying that she was normal, quote unquote, before her accident and that she could benefit from higher education. And she felt very vulnerable because that would be attached to her file forever and ever. And she just felt very exposed by the experience. And they were, Sydney here's talking in the middle quote about getting accommodations. She went to a small school. Her higher her high school was very small. Um, she said she classified it as underfunded. I didn't really follow up on that to check, but she said there really wasn't a resource for her. She wasn't really provided with accommodations. Her parents had to pay out of pocket for tutoring for accommodations for her. And here she just was so excited and so relieved to be able to have that meeting with the Office of Disability Services and say, yeah, yeah, you can get accommodations, no big deal. And the final student, I wasn't expecting to have, I didn't know you needed accommodations for anxiety. So this final quote here was, was very powerful because, again, it shows people with disabilities might not identify themselves as having a disability just because that level of awareness is there in society because a lot of people think disabilities think oh people who use wheelchairs like physical disabilities that you can see not the invisible disabilities that people might be feeling on the inside or you know like Sydney had said well it's my brain you know it's just a problem with my brain that's what it is but in fact it's just people learn differently and it's the implementation of the combinations is where it gets complicated so we'll see that here 
Now this first quote here, uh, Sydney's talking about, um, no, excuse me, that's Alex. Um, it's not about being smart, I just learned differently, it takes me longer to process things. So Alex had the experience of faculty members saying, well, you might just not be smart enough to take this class right now. And just outright say that to her. And she thought, no, I just need these accommodations, if you just help me out with that, we can go forward. But the faculty members, they just, she later goes on to say that they didn't want to be bothered with something additional. And the, sec the second quote there is Shane, my mom was like, that should be protected without having to reveal it to you. This is interesting because Shane's faculty members, Shane has a food allergy, severe food allergies. She had to stand up in front of the classroom each and every first class and talk about her food allergy. And she felt so violated because she was standing up in front of a lecture hall. I mean, can you imagine being you know, a young student on campus and you're going to stand up in front of a lecture hall at 300 and talk about your nut allergy? And a lot of students, they eat granola bars. And you know, we've all been students packing things in our bags. You know, a lot of those contain nuts. And so then a lot of people associated and said, oh, that's the girl, that's the girl why we can't eat. And they just were really adverse to her after that. And she felt like she shouldn't have to be the one talking about her accommodations to everyone. The faculty member should be like, hey, we just have a student with a nut allergy, we can't have anything in here. But unfortunately, the faculty members, they made her stand up every semester and talk about it. Okay, so for each of the results, I want you to pick one and top. Ooh, you're okay. top. All right. Okay. All right. Let's because we it. have it in front of us. Okay. And we read it. Okay. I want you to All right. pick something to top. Okay. Then we'll move forward. Yes. All right. So we've got, back over here, um, academic life. A lot of the individuals, um, would say like at heart it gets hard at times for me to stay motivated to complete my work that I, um, or that I should stay in school. Some of these people they felt like they were not being validated as learners and students and it was tough because they had a very very strong identity as uh, intelligent. Uh, potentially one student she was denied her accommodations and she thought this is the first B that I've gotten since eighth grade. Are you kidding me? And she was just really upset because she wasn't able to use her accommodations. So that really affected her. Uh, another thing, um, going back real quick about Shane, I know you said one, this is really important. Um, <laughs> and there's the, two. Okay, <laughs> there's two for this one, I promise. Uh, so this one, um, Shane said that her grades weren't affected by having to leave the classroom because remember she's got the food allergy. She would have to get up and leave if there was you know, a, a contaminant, she, she could feel it. So she would have to get up and walk out of lectures. She's like, my grades are still fine, but what about that knowledge acquisition that I could have lost? She's like, you know, it's not showing in my grades, but I'm sure I lost knowledge. Um, support from others. Uh, one really cool thing that I found out about is dyslexia. It's a dyslexic font. Uh, Sydney was talking about it. She said that her brother told her about it. And it's actually available on Overdrive, that the e-reader app from a lot of libraries, they have it. And they have dyslexic font, so we need to have that, I think, at universities, because then students could just read their papers, do their assignments at the testing center. And she said, oh, no, it's not available. I said, what? It's not available in the testing center? Are you kidding me? And uh, so she's like, let's take that on. So we're going to take it on. Um, so that's one thing, is that um, people had support of their, their family, but then their friends, it, it was kind of hit or miss with their friends. Uh, a scene in social interaction, I hate that my whole personality, uh, that's my whole personality when someone meets me, even my closest friends seem resentful of it. So it's a lot of their friends say, you know, it's like that the frustration. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, that's part of your identity. They're mad at part of your identity. That's, that's pretty, pretty interesting. And a lot of the participants were so involved, um, involved on campus, involved in community organizations, and uh, one participant was even involved on the PTO at her daughter's school. Now, assumptions and stigma. Uh, one student said, my mom and dad kind of sheltered me from that. So the student's first exposure was stigma. Um, this was a student with autism spectrum disorder, um, was here at school. So 
you come to college, right? You're brand new. We all remember that time where you kind of feel, you know, where do I fit here? And now the student at college is being exposed to stigma for the first time. Uh, the student did not disclose in uh, their high school or elementary education their disability. And uh, students, uh, for example, one person said, well, you're being dramatic. One person said their friends think they're being dramatic about their learning needs. And let's see, let me see if I can pick one more. Oh, and then one student said that it's like burning a lot of bridges. Um, it's a guessing game. You can burn a lot of bridges, but it's one statement. I have dyslexia. And this was Sydney because she's in, in, in an engineering program. She has been um, excluded, quote unquote. She's been uh, excluded from participating on robotics teams and research projects. She would email and email and email and then they'd say, oh, we've chosen someone else. Or, oh, we've decided to go a different direction and then just not email her again. And it's interesting because mental disabilities are, um, so the invisible disabilities are seen as totally different, as if they have no impact on the person and by a lot of the people. And this is so fascinating. Um, not the participants, but external people. Um, let's see. Um, and then this is an interesting one here with barriers. I didn't qualify for any accommodations on the SAT or the ACT. I was asking to have it on a computer so she could type her essay so they could actually read and understand it. But she scored too high. This, this was Sydney. Um, she, she was sassy. She had a lot to say. Um, but this, this was fascinating because she scored too high. She has dyslexia, but she scored too high. So she couldn't get accommodations. And she said, that's funny because I could have gotten, she ended up getting a 26 on her ACT. Whereas a lot of us know, the higher the ACT score, the more the scholarship, et cetera, et cetera, the better the college admission. Well, she felt really excluded for that. And she's like, that had an impact on my complete life. Because potentially I could have less student loans, potentially I could have gone to a different school. All these other things had impacted her because of this one event that, yeah, she has a disability, but she's, she did too good. She did too good. And let's see. Um, some professors said, this is your problem, not mine. And this was really shocking to a lot of the students. Some of them had awesome teachers. For example, one student talked about um, taking math exams and then going back to the professor's office if you know they weren't finished. It was like no big deal. But others had these situations where that's your problem, not mine. Or you've seen plenty smart, um, you know, why do you need accommodations sort of a thing. Um, let's see. And let's see here. The discussion. Um, so higher education impacts the outcomes of students with disabilities. The identity of students with disabilities uh, in really impacts their self-worth, their motivation, their goals. The stigma prevents students with disabilities from disclosing their disabilities to the higher education institution, so potentially not succeeding as well. Self-advocacy and transition education for students with disabilities seemed to be a strong point because some students were still developing their self-advocacy skills and others felt very strong about their self-advocacy skills. Campus awareness and sensitivity for students with disabilities. Now this isn't just for faculty members, but for all levels, you know, staff and the student body, because there were some situations where students in the res halls uh, were having exposure to issues like allergens, for example, um, and the students didn't feel like the roommates were taking it seriously, when in fact it is very serious. And then lack of knowledge about accommodating and ed educating students with disabilities. Now there's a study where faculty members said, you know what, if I had more training, I would love that because I would feel more empowered to help the students with disabilities and accommodate them, but I know nothing about this, so I don't feel comfortable accommodating. They just had no knowledge of it. So we really need to uh, empower the teachers. So why these results? Uh, so the societal perception of people with disabilities has impacted the identity development of people with disabilities. The lack of campus sensitivity training for students, so the students missed out on 
experiences with student groups because of exclusion or were exposed to, for example, in Shane's instance, allergens that were life-threatening when students didn't take it seriously. Um, students would sneak granola bars under their desk in the back of the room and say, oh, she's in the front, she'll never know. Well, she knew. Um, inadequate preparation of administrators regarding supporting students with disabilities. Now, we are very lucky here at St. Louis University to have a graduate program for higher education administrators that prepares us to work and be aware of diverse needs of diverse learners, whereas a lot of the other programs do not include a component about students with disabilities in their education. And poor education of the faculty members regarding accommodations at higher education institutions. We need to empower the faculty to support the students. And if we provide the faculty members with the knowledge about accommodations, about disabilities, about the process, maybe they would feel more comfortable accommodating the students and recognizing that students aren't trying to get a leg up on everybody else. They're just trying to get the fair. Has anybody seen that graphic about fair and equal? You know, equal boxes aren't, don't just make everyone equal. It's, it's what's fair depending on their situation. So what should we do? Well, promote services available on campus. Lane was talking about in her interview how there are all these academic services promoted at student orientation, but then it's like, oh, then there's campus counseling at the very bottom. She's like, oh my gosh, the counseling centers help me so much. Why is that not at the very top? And she said that students actually get free visits. There's a number of free visits that students can get at the campus counseling center. I had no idea. My gosh, I've been here for 10 years. So we need to really promote those services that are available on campus to our students. Sensitivity training for staff and students. And then educational components in higher education administration programs to prepare administrators to work with those students. Accommodation and awareness training for all faculty members to really empower them. And continue learning about students with disabilities. We need to continue finding out about them and finding out from them. So future research, I've got a lot of slides on this. Can I, can I say everyone? Okay. <laughs> uh, so transition preparation of students with disabilities, we need to examine that. And this was interesting to me because you have guidance from above, and we all know laws are interpreted, right? So we have idea guiding from above. And the first, one of the first earlier drafts of idea said, oh, transition preparation should start at age 12. Now it's 16. That only gives about two years or so before you graduate, and they got to take off and fly. Well, that's that's a pretty short window, and so all and also the schools, so many different schools funnel into so many different higher education institutions. So how can you find out about the transition and preparation of each of the individual students to go into different environments? So I feel like we need to examine that a lot better to get a better picture of that to see how are the students doing, and maybe even with different disabilities, saying okay with your particular disability, how are you doing? Because it's shown with students with visual disabilities and students who are deaf, they graduate at the same rate as students without disabilities from higher education. But you have those students with so many different disabilities. Are we examining them? Are we supporting them? Or are we just doing a blanket accommodation? As I've seen with a lot of the students, they said, yeah, I got these accommodations. And they all seem to be relatively identical. We need to examine the lived experiences with college students with disabilities. We had, unfortunately, the study was limited to one institution. This only gives one picture of one institution. This needs to be expanded to uh, more institutions, even institutions examining their, you know, their neighbors, etc., seeing people in the region and how we can better ourselves in the region. Students with disabilities who choose not to disclose their disabilities. This one really it's important because students who don't disclose, they're risking their academic future. And I feel like we really need to examine them to see, okay, what we, what can we do to make you comfortable disclosing your disabilities so that you can get the support and have that, that academic future. And then examining the experience of students with disabilities in specific degree programs. So for example, like Cindy was talking, she said, I felt like I was excluded from a lot of the engineering experiences that would prepare me for the future. So we need to look and see, okay, what's it like in different degree programs? And then, um, let's see here. 
uh, students with disabilities transitioning into their careers was another was another piece that I thought would be important because we focus on the transition between high school to college, but then what about going into their careers? Are we examining what's happening with their transition? There's some advocacy, the comfort level of individuals without disabilities dealing with individuals with disabilities. And then the persistence of college students with disabilities in general, because a lot of times in the research it's shown individuals will start and then they'll transfer to different college, or they'll transfer to a cl college closer to home. And that's interesting to me because some students will go one semester and then transfer back to a community college at home. So obviously they're not getting that support that they need uh, in the community, at the school, or in the community around the school. And examine identity um, and development of college students with disabilities. Uh, Gibson's Disability Identity Development Instrument uh, can examine the level of identity. And I think that that's something we need to, again, take more personally and examine is the identity development of students with disabilities. Because we need to empower them to go forward and really focus on them as a population instead of just lumping them in with the rest of the student population and really try and support their needs as learners. And that's the end. Thank you.